What's up Westside? My name's Gianna and I'm so glad that you decided to log on here today and watch with us. Maybe it's your first time here or maybe you haven't clicked our connect link down below. If that is the case, then I need you to click that link. It's gonna say new. It's gonna bring you to a page that just lets you fill out all the information about you so we can get to know you, follow up with you, and of course, gift you a free Westside mug. Stay tuned for some announcements and the rest of the service. We hope you enjoy and we're so glad that you're here. Uh, well, again, you guys, welcome. I'm so glad that you are here and that you've made it today. Um, like I said, my, or I don't know if I said my name, but my name's Gianna. I'm one of the leaders here at Westside. And um, again, thank you for coming if you're new. We have a special little gift for you. If you haven't filled out one of our connection sheets, you'll see it on um, one of the pews up there. They're little yellow sheets. You just fill out your information um, and then you can head back to the connection booth once we're done and get in exchange for it, you get a free Westside mug, which is pretty cool. Uh, we have a, you might have seen it out there. And the, the West Side mug shot, you get to take a picture with your mug. It's super fun. Um, but yeah, head out and get one of those if you haven't already. Or you can buy one for $8, whatever you'd like. Um, and then also, you guys, we have some great things coming up. So uh, again, if you're new, we have pizza with the pastors. That's going to be next Monday night, I believe, at uh, 6 p.m. And that's at the loft. And that's just a great way to get to know West Side, get to know what we're about, and just our way to get to know you a little bit more. So signups are out there if you want to sign up in person. Signups are also online. You can look at the email that uh, if you get our emails, or you can just head to the website, go to events, and you can sign up there. Um, and then also, you guys, very exciting. We also have our community groups starting in February, the beginning of February. And today, we actually, in the lobby after service, there's going to be some of the leaders out there, and they're just there to get to meet you. You get to ask them some questions, maybe about the group, um, the community group that they're leading, just so you can get kind of a feel for, you know, maybe what you want or if that is something that you want to do. Um, Signups are going to be live next Sunday here and online. So just remember that signups don't start till next Sunday, but today you just get to explore, ask some questions, and see if community groups is something that you want to do. Um, I highly encourage it. So a great, especially during the, the craziness of what our, like, days look like now, having community is so important, and we hope you utilize that. Um, and then lastly, it's always important, you guys, to, uh, I, one of my favorite things I get to do in life is just be a part of a team, whether that was sports growing up or now just being a part of the Westside team. Um, but just, we always want people to um, want to be involved. So if you want to be a part of a team, feel free, let us know, let me know, Brooks, Courtney, uh, we'd love to get you paired up with just some way to be involved at Westside serving in a team. And then lastly, Thank you guys so much for um, just your faithful giving and um, this, just the generosity that you show Westside. We really couldn't do it, of course not without uh, your support, but also with prayer too. So we thank you for giving us um, your faithfulness in prayer and generosity. Um, and there's some ways to do that as well if you want to continue to do it or maybe start to do it. So you can do that online, in person, um, through the text to give option was pretty cool, or the Tidely app. But again, if that's something that you want to do or continue doing, you're feel free to. And we just thank you so much for it. Um, now we have a special guest coming up, and Brooks is going to show a little video introducing him. And yeah, so just give him a, a nice welcome when he's up here. But here's Brooks. Hey, Westside. Good to see you. Pastor Brooks here. Hey, sorry I don't get to be with you this Sunday. My family and I are, are off doing some traveling, but I get to introduce Andy Mahoney to you. Andy's going to be speaking today. Andy is a Foursquare pastor up in Portland. He pastors Rivers, Riversgate Foursquare Church, and he's gracious enough to drive down and be with us tonight for church. Now, Andy and I have some serious history. We first met each other when we were on a soccer team together when we were in the fifth grade up in Oak Harbor, Washington, uh, where both of us grew up. Our friendship grew and grew over time, and eventually we were a part of the same youth group, same Foursquare Church there in Oak Harbor. And I love this picture of Andy at youth group because there's Andy in the front, but if you look in the back, you will see Gabe Barrero, who was our youth, youth pastor, who eventually was the one to plant 
this church, Westside Faith Center, back about 17 years ago. And then if you also look in the background, you will see my future wife, Christy, um, who was also a part of our youth group growing up. Senior year, Andy took this gal to prom, and this also is my future wife. So there's that. But listen, I just have tons and tons of respect for Andy, and it's a thrill to have him be able to be here with us at Westside. So Andy, thank you so much for being here with us. Take it away. Oh man, isn't Brooks the best? Seriously, he's, he's awesome. You guys are really blessed to have him as your pastor. It's so fun to be here, you guys. I worked at Westside Faith Center from 2003 to 2007, and it feels like a lifetime ago, and a few of you are still here, and there's a whole bunch of new people that I wanna meet too, so it's a joy to come back. It seems like I come back about every five years or so, um, and it's amazing. It's always a joy to be here. Those uh, three, four years of my life were still one of my favorite seasons of ministry ever. And in fact, uh, I, I served as a youth pastor here, and I actually just became the youth pastor of a church again uh, because our youth pastor quit, and so I'm the youth pastor again, and it's wonderful. And uh, I'm actually a little bit bummed to not be with my youth group tonight because it's been so fun. It's temporary. I turned on that youth pastor gear and it is so fun. But anyways, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to read the first 12 verses here in a minute. Um, and I grew up, I don't know about you guys, I grew up, uh, I was uh, baptized in the Presbyterian church, Sunday schooled in the Lutheran church, confirmed in the Methodist church, and then really met Jesus at a Foursquare church. And then I went to a Church of Christ seminary. So I'm like a church mutt. Uh, but sometimes when I've gotten done reading the passage, I'll just out of like the deep recesses of tradition say, uh, this is the word of the Lord. And I did it, uh, anybody grow up with that? You read the gospel passage, you say, this is the word of the Lord. And uh, a like two, three months ago, we were reading a tough passage out of Matthew. We've been working through the gospel of Matthew. And, um, and it just hit me like, oh, we just read the words of Jesus. They were kind of tough. And I just said, this is the word of the Lord. And it, it, was, it was as much for me, this reminder of like, whoa, like these are the words of Jesus. What an incredible gift. What, a, what an amazing privilege to be able to hear them, to be able to come to this place, just as, um, I, didn't, I don't know his name, but just talking about whatever reason you should. At the very least, you're going to get the words of Jesus tonight. And that's such a, such a grace. Um, so, so amazing. So I'm going to say it when I, after I finish reading this. Some of you may say, praise be to God or whatever. Don't feel like you have to say anything, but I'm going to say it to remind myself of what we're doing here tonight. Matthew 5, 1 through 12. One day, as he, Jesus, saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. All right, well, you, this is the third week of a series that you guys are doing right now called How to Misunderstand the Bible, correct? And I just listened to last week's message. It was awesome. Again, you guys have an amazing 
pastor, teacher. Uh, Brooks is so gifted at teaching the word. And I'm excited to be a part of this series because uh, in the same way as Brooks, my heart beats for the, this beautiful gift of God's word that is so often misunderstood in so many different ways. And specifically when he said what it was, he actually he preached at our church last week and it was awesome. Um, he said what, the, what it was and, and I said, well, you know, like I, I, I would love to talk about the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount because I think that's often an overlooked or misunderstood part of the Bible in many different ways. It, it can be either like become this legalistic monster or it can just be written off as irrelevant. And so we're just really only have time to look at the Beatitudes, um, but that's, that's what we're looking at this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever it is. I am lost in regards to time right now. But are you guys familiar with a guy named Dietrich Bonhoeffer, German pastor during Nazi Germany? He knew a thing or two about the Beatitudes of Jesus. If you're not familiar, he was a Lutheran pastor in Germany during the rise of the Third Reich. Um, he was in seminary in the U.S. as all that was beginning to happen. And he could have stayed in the U.S., which would have been the easier thing to do during that era. But he felt called to go back to Germany to serve the church and to help the church resist the rise of Nazism. And so he remained true to the call of Christ and, and followed that call back to Germany. His resistance to Hitler and being a voice of dissension landed him in a Nazi prison uh, for a handful of years before he was executed uh, on April 9th, 1945. Um, while in prison, he continued to write all kinds of letters and poetry and meanderings and thoughts. You can, you can read these in a book called uh, Letters and Papers from Prison. Um, and like the Apostle Paul's prison letters, much of Bonhoeffer's uh, writings in that time are marked by this incredible resolve and hope in Jesus amidst horrific circumstances. And so nine months uh, before his death, he wrote a poem called Sorrow and Joy. And it's a powerful poem that meditates on the close connection between sorrow and joy, where those two things seem at first to be polar opposites, right? But they are more connected than maybe we want them to be. Joy is maybe like the most welcome sort of emotion and experience that we can have, right? Everybody wants to experience joy. Sorrow is dreaded, uh, avoided, resisted, ignored, denied. Um, but you guys remember that Pixar movie, Inside Out? It kind of shows like the, the relationship uh, of these different emotions, that they're not mutually exclusive. And in fact, I recently heard um, Miroslav Wolf talking about how no, no, Honest joy can be fully joy because you're aware of sorrow and, and vice versa. So the, the Christian life is to learn to have a joy-filled sorrow and a sorrow-filled joy. Anyways, what he talks about is, he, he says this in the poem, what then is joy? What then is sorrow? He says, time alone can decide between them. Sometimes we don't know until it's, over. Time alone can decide between them. And I get a hint of that when we read the Beatitudes. Our church, as I said, has been working through the gospel of Matthew. We're going to finish it this Easter. We've been in it for four years, you guys. We've taken lots of breaks, but it's been quite a journey. Um, we spent a year on the Sermon, uh, sermon on the Mount alone. And so uh, I, I love it. I love, I love this gospel of Matthew. And uh, we spent eight weeks on the Beatitudes. We spent one week on each of them. And it was, it was such a challenge. It was pre-pandemic. And we're coming in and life is pretty good for everybody, right? Mostly. And to hear blessed are the morning, right? 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. It's a weird way to look at blessing. It's a counterintuitive way to look at blessings. And Jesus' list of blessings are mostly things that I try to avoid in life, if I'm honest, right? I'd rather be of good cheer than poor in spirit. Mourning, I mean, come on. Like, I'd rather not. I'd rather not you know, rather just people didn't die. We'd rather we, there weren't things that we had to mourn about. I'd rather not have a global pandemic two years in, you guys, right? And blessed are the persecuted. You, you hear these things, and right now, you, you, there, there's 70,000 Christians in prison camps in North Korea right now. Blessed are the persecuted, Jesus says. Blessed, fortunate, good news. Because sometimes you just kind of feel like, good grief. I don't always get it. C.S. Lewis said this about the Sermon on the Mount. This is talking about the whole thing. He said, as to caring for the Sermon on the Mount, if caring for here means liking or enjoying, I suppose no one cares for it. Who can like being knocked flat on his face by a sledgehammer? I can hardly imagine a more deadly spiritual condition than that of the man who can read that passage with tranquil pleasure. Reminds me of the quote that, that Brooks talked about last week of the hammer being an anvil that's like, you know, doled all hammers or something like that. I really messed it up. But if you go listen to it if you weren't here for it. But over the last two years of this pandemic, maybe you've seen some of these beatitudes come alive in ways that they hadn't before. As the world's been shaken and our lives have been shaken and ground to a halt and all these different things, the hypothetical nature of, yeah, blessed are the poor in spirit. Like we've had to kind of lean into, oh, like we're, we're all poor in spirit right now. And we got to figure this out, how there's blessing here. Because together we've been mourning and together we've realized just how meek and powerless we are in this world. Maybe together we've been hungering and thirsting and crying out for things to be set right. And in the middle of all of that, Jesus' creative, healing, ordering, illuminating word hovers over these chaotic waters of our life and it speaks life to it. Much in the same way that we see the, the Holy Spirit, the, the Spirit hovering over the chaotic waters of creation and out of that chaotic void, the word of God speaks, bringing life. Are you with me? God says, let there be light where there was only darkness. Let there be plants where there was only barrenness. Let there be animals and fish where there was no living thing. And let there be man and woman where God had no one to represent him. These are the first gospel declarations. Gospel meaning good news. Creation is an act of one good news statement after another that brings everything into being. The first good news ever paradoxically bringing light out of darkness and life out of barrenness, life out of nothingness. And as we look at the Beatitudes today, as we just read them, I want us to imagine Jesus' word ringing out over that same sense of chaos, that same sense of barrenness as he comes and he proclaims these blessings over a people who are beat up, a people who are knocked down, a people who are oppressed, a people who are wondering what tomorrow holds, people who maybe don't have hope. And so Jesus proclaims blessing over a people who live under a cloud of cursing. He declares good news to those in a sea of bad news, right? He declares this glorious inheritance. We just read it to those with a bleak future who have nothing to look forward to. And he reveals a presence, his presence in the midst of perceived absence. And so with the word of God ringing out over creation, let's picture Jesus, the voice of God, the person of God, the word of God himself speaking these words over not just the people on the Sermon on the Mount, but over us. I'm going to read them one more time uh, from the message version, which I, I think is really, really wonderful. And my hope for all of us tonight is that his words would transform our circumstances, our situations into sanctuaries of his presence. 
That's my hope and prayer, that his words, these words, would transform our circumstances into sanctuaries of presence. So maybe even close your eyes and imagine him speaking these words over us. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are. No more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you'll find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are in your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Hear the word of Jesus. You are blessed. Right here, right now, just as you are. Not when the pandemic's over, becomes an endemic or whatever we're hoping for at this point, right? Not when you have job security, not when everything goes back to normal, not when all of your questions are answered, but right now you are blessed because surely one of these beatitudes resonates with you in some way. So I wanna offer just three reflections before we wrap up tonight that I think help us understand what these Beatitudes are all about. The first thing is this, the Beatitudes are good news, not good advice. The Beatitudes are good news, not good advice. So the word for blessed here is, is makarios, it's the Greek word. It's most often translated blessed, which is why, why we normally hear blessed are the blessed are, but we, we are familiar maybe with some of the other translations. Uh, one, one translation is wonderful news. Another one is congratulations, which is funny. Congratulations to the poor in spirit. But that's really what Jesus is saying here. Another, another translation is how lucky, <laughs> how fortunate, Ooh. how wonderful. And what Jesus is doing here is there was a tradition of sayings called makarisms, centered around that word makarios, that centered around the good life, the flourishing life, little sayings of how fortunate for the the rich or whatever else, things that make sense. And Jesus's are very counterintuitive. He doesn't say the normal things that it would say, how lucky, how blessed, how wonderful. He says these other things about how blessed you're poor in spirit. And we're left thinking, what? I don't want, I don't want to be poor in spirit. I don't want to be mourning. And what it's important to get here is that Jesus isn't telling you to be that. Okay, he's not saying, hey, you need to be poor in spirit. Well, why don't you just lower your head down a little bit here, Andy, right? He's not saying, hey, you need to be mourning. And you're like, the life is pretty good right now. You don't have to engage in this thing. He's not giving advice. He's proclaiming good news. That when you find yourself in these places that life inevitably leads you to, he's there. And there's blessing. We've thought about it this way. What, what we discover is that those most at odds with the way things are, are the ones most in sync with the way things ought to be. Okay, when we think about the kingdom, when we think about what Jesus is saying here, those most at odds with the way things are are often most in sync with the way things ought to be. Because I believe God's put a longing in us for rightness, for the kingdom, 
in Ecclesiastes, it says he's put eternity in the hearts of men, right? In chapter four of Matthew, we see Jesus announcing that the kingdom is near, announcing that the kingdom has come. And we discover that it isn't the comfortable or the well-off that are longing for that kingdom, right? Jesus is killed at the end of his life, right? He's, he's put on the cross. There, there weren't people longing for God's reign and God's justice other than who? The poor in spirit. The ones who were at odds with the th- way things were. And so he comes and he declares this good news. Are you fed up with how things are? Well, guess what? You're on the right track. And we're going to make things right eventually. Are you heartbroken? It's good. It's good. Because you recognize the need for God to make all things new. And praise God that in Jesus, he's already at work. Amen? The Beatitudes are good news, not good advice. Next thing is this. The Beatitudes are descriptions, not disciplines. The Beatitudes are descriptions, not disciplines. The Sermon on the Mount has a fascinating history within the life of the church. There's a Jewish scholar named Pinchas Lapid, and he says this uh, in talking about the Sermon on the Mount. He says, the history of the impact of the Sermon on the Mount can largely be described in terms of an attempt to domesticate everything in it that is shocking, demanding, and uncompromising and render it harmless. Vast amounts of energy throughout church history have been spent excusing ourselves from the Sermon on the Mount because we don't always know what to do with it. You think about just the arguments that have been developed to convince Jesus followers, and I'm not saying that they're right or wrong, but there's a lot of work you have to do to get around Jesus' call to nonviolence in the Sermon on the Mount just for starters. Like there's a lot of mental gymnastics that have to take place to get around this idea of loving enemies to get to the place where we can take up arms against our enemies, right? As Christians. That's a lot of work. Because Jesus didn't just preach it. He did it. And then the church did it for 300 years. They committed to that way of Jesus. But we spend a lot of time trying to excuse ourselves from it. And in the same way that we try to get out of some of these harder teachings of Jesus, we also ironically moralize these good news statements of Jesus. We turn these these proclamations of good news into somehow it needs to be a spiritual discipline of some sorts, as though suffering were a discipline to pursue. Right? Like, have, have you ever found yourself in that place of that, like that? I, I've seen it in my life many times, this pursuit of varsity Christianity where life has to be hard <laughs> because I'm following Jesus. Like that's turning this statement of good news into a discipline. But Jesus is describing who's blessed. When you find yourself in this place, you're blessed. And this world is a broken, hurting place in desperate need of the redemption and restoration of Jesus. One of the church fathers, Gregory of Nyssa, said it's impossible to look on things as they really are down here without tears. Like you're gonna gonna get there. You don't have to pursue it. You don't have to turn suffering into a discipline. And so the Beatitudes, what they help do is foster in us an honest assessment of the world and our circumstances and our lives. And in the first four Beatitudes, what we see is is that we play a passive role in them, right? Poor in spirit is something that we experience. Mourning is something that we experience, something that happens. Meekness is where you find yourself, what your your place in life is. Hungering, hunger, like that's something that happens. It's a passive role. But the next three are, they become a little more active. 
Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. There's a great commentary, two-volume commentary on Matthew by a guy named Frederick Dale Bruner who points out that these active beatitudes are not conditions of God's grace, but are the necessary consequences. We don't get grace because we're merciful and because we're peacemakers. and because they're, they're the outpouring of that. When we've experienced God's grace, when we've experienced God's mercy, we then pass that on. They're byproducts of a life surrendered to Jesus. And as we become that vessel, right? We experience God's blessing in the midst of that. So the Beatitudes are descriptions, not disciplines. The third thing is this. The Beatitudes are promises, not commands. You notice all these points are pretty similar to each other. Just really trying to drive this home. The Beatitudes are promises, not commands. There's a whole lot of commands that follow in the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is not for the faint of heart. I remember um, when we started our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, I asked six people in the church to memorize a sixth of the Sermon on the Mount, and, and they all recited it. It's still one of my favorite church services ever, because we just sat there, and six different people preached the Sermon on the Mount. Like making eye contact (laughs) and walking the room. And it was really uncomfortable (laughs) because it's a really intense three chapters of scripture. And they recited and we heard, we just heard the words of Jesus without commentary, without explanation. We just pretended as though we were there hearing. And it was the most powerful, intimidating, uncomfortable sermon I've ever sat through in a church, for sure. The commands of the sermon will follow. But true to form, the demands of Jesus are preceded by the mercy and the promises of Jesus. And what we discover in seeking to follow Jesus, when we take Jesus and his teaching at face value, we will be driven back to the very beginning of the sermon over and over and over again because we will find ourselves to be poor in spirit anytime we seek to love our enemies. Anytime we seek to put greed to death in our life. Anytime we try to make sure our right hand doesn't know what our left hand is doing because we want the accolades, <laughs> right? And so we catch ourselves and it's like, oh gosh, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And we experience that poor in spiritness that comes from just trying to follow Jesus. And we go back and we hear the words of Jesus, blessed are the poor in spirit. My favorite paraphrase of that first beatitude is blessed are those who recognize their need and the promise of the beatitude is for theirs is the kingdom there is a promise there there is a promise to the poor in spirit that they are right where they need to be because they recognize how desperately they need jesus So the Beatitudes are promises, not commands. Uh, Olivia and and the team can come back. I'm getting ready to wrap up here. But here we are, right? Two years in. (laughs) Two two years, almost two years. Like we're coming up on two years. Like anybody else over it? (laughs) Anybody else tired of being poor in spirit right now? My gosh, two years into it. And we have this wonderful, incredible news from Jesus. Poor in spirit, check. Mourning, check. Meek, check. Blessed. In all of it, blessed. Hungering and thirsting for God to make all things new. Bonhoeffer's poem ends by pointing us to 
the opportunity that sorrow provides. This is from the poem that, that I mentioned at the beginning. He says, oh, you mothers and loved ones, then, ah, then comes your hour, the hour for true devotion. Then your hour comes, you friends and brothers. Loyal hearts can change the face of sorrow. Softly encircle it with love's most gentle, unearthly radiance. Loyal hearts can change the face of sorrow. What a statement written from somebody sitting in a tiny little prison cell. Loyal hearts can change the face of sorrow. In the Beatitudes, we see and we hear when he experienced the loyal heart of God who enters into the fray. Jesus, who enters into this mess, into this world, into oppression, into persecution, into suffering. He enters into the void, into our chaos, and he declares blessing, taking sorrows and transforming them into joys, inviting the weary and the heavy laden and the poor in spirit and the broken into his kingdom of wholeness transforming our circumstances into sanctuaries of his presence. That we, made and renewed in his image, can be the loyal hearts that recognize the endless opportunities around us for joy in the midst of sorrow. To be that light on a hill that he talks about in the Sermon on the Mount, to be that salt in this world, to be the hands and feet of Jesus himself in this world. Amen? Amen. I'm going to close us in prayer here. Lord Jesus, in your Beatitudes, you free us to find the blessing in being honest. These beatitudes reflect a sober, clear-eyed estimation of this world. We are poor in spirit. We are mourning. We are meek. We recognize our own weakness, Lord. And we are desperate for your righteousness to flood this earth, making all things right and new. You invite us to see it, to feel it, to experience the heaviness of this life. And as we do, you infuse our sorrows with your presence, filling them with joy. You cultivate a hunger in us for your rule and reign in our lives and in this world. You shape in us a desire for your kingdom. And before we can ever even ask for it, you've already said it's ours. Ours is the kingdom. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Fill us with your spirit that we may embody your loyal heart to the world in desperate need of the good news of your kingdom through which you are making all things new to the glory of your Father. Amen. Thank you so much again for logging on and being here with us. We hope you enjoyed and we hope you have a great rest of your week.